God is telling us that this same Jesus who has come is coming again. If it doesn't come to pass, it doesn't come from God. If it's not accurate, the prophet is to be executed. God said there's coming a day when I'm going to shake the world. But something will not be shaken. Amen. Well, glad to see you all tonight. Uh, I love the words, the song that we just sang, Set a Fire in My Soul. I, I just love, you know what does that for me? Opening the Word of God. That's when a fire starts to be ignited in me, and I have learned that the more you study God's Word, the hungrier you get for it. And you believe this is the Word of God? What we're going to dive into tonight? You believe there's power in here? You believe that it came from Him? Do you believe that he wants us to read it and to understand it? Well, I think that your presence here in this prophecy study, which we call Understanding Bible Prophecy, shows that you value prophecy, which is to say that you value the Word of God, because as I've told you before, 40% of your Bible is predictive prophecy. And so with that in mind, we, uh, we dive back in with a passion, with a vigor. Last week, we started looking at the book of Daniel. One of my favorite Old Testament books, one of my favorite books in the Bible, period. And what drives us to Daniel in this study uh, initially are the words of Jesus himself because he said in Luke 21, he was speaking prophetically of the coming of the Son of Man. And that's the kind of event we're usually fixated on when we talk about Bible prophecy, something that is in the future, something that is far flung. It's the end times. So when the Son of Man comes, establishing his kingdom on the earth, he said that will not happen until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And so what is that? What are the times of the Gentiles? Well, that's what we, be- we began to unpack last week as we looked at Daniel chapter 2. And we identified the times of the Gentiles as a period during which several Gentile world empires would rule not just over earth, but over Israel, being the common denominator between them. And it all started with the kingdom of Babylon. And we saw how near the beginning of the Babylonian empire, the Babylonian uh, exile for the Jews, that God gave a dream to their king, a man named Nebuchadnezzar. And he gave him a dream that just sent a chill down his spine, gave him fits, scared the daylights out of him. He could not explain it. And so he calls for the Jewish prophet Daniel, who happened to be in exile in his courts there in Babylon. Daniel came and interpreted this dream. Not only interpreted it, but told him what he dreamed, if you recall. And in this dream, you got a chart last week of this dream. And in that chart was depicted a metal man a statue. And God gave Nebuchadnezzar a vision of a metal statue. And each section of that statue was a different metal. And so Daniel interpreted that. And he said each of these sections represents a different kingdom. And the first, starting at the head, the head of gold, just to recap, that's Babylon. In fact, he said, that is you, O king, Nebuchadnezzar. You are the head of gold. And then as you descend down that statue, you've got the the chest and shoulders and arms of silver, and that would be the kingdom of Medo-Persia, which would come historically after Babylon. And then you've got the belly and thighs of bronze, and that would represent the kingdom of Greece, which came after Medo-Persia. And then he said the legs of iron, that's another kingdom, and we identified that kingdom as being the kingdom of Rome, the empire of Rome because they were reputed to crush their enemies under an iron heel, as it were. And then there was the feet of iron mixed with clay. And we talked about how that was indicative of a future empire that is yet to come, Uh, but one that, that harkens back to the empire of Rome in that there is iron present. But that clay that is integrated into that, that we said was representative of some, some uh, places that were geographically perhaps outside of Rome, but aligned with Rome. And we said that was sort of a, uh, a coalition of nations one day. And we supported that uh, with cross-referencing to Revelation. And we talked about that kingdom being depicted there in Revelation as well. And then we saw finally in that dream one last world empire 
And this is a large stone, Daniel said, not cut by human hands. And we identified that as the stone, the rock of ages, the cornerstone, Jesus Christ himself. And we see that stone in the vision, reducing that entire statue uh, as unto dust. And then we watch that stone expand and fill the whole earth, meaning it's a kingdom, it's an empire that will never end. It will be an everlasting kingdom, and it's the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And so that's just a recap of what we, what we talked about last week, all depicted in the chart that you received. And by the way, you could still access that chart. If anybody is watching our video on YouTube, uh, you can find session two uh, on YouTube on our website. You can access a PDF of that chart as well as the outline, and that's true for all of our sessions. But tonight, we're going to move on in this amazing book, and we're going to go to chapter seven and chapter eight, and you uh, have been given a new chart. And uh, we're going to learn about a vision given not to Nebuchadnezzar, but to God's prophet, the prophet Daniel himself. And Daniel is going to get basically the same content as Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, But if you look at the chart that you've been handed tonight, you you see that metal statue on the right-hand side. But we're going to focus beginning in that center column, which uh, derives from Daniel chapter 7. And it's the same kingdoms that are spoken of. But instead of metal, they are depicted as beasts, four great beasts. And when you get to uh, chapter 8, on the left side of that chart, there are a couple more beasts that, are, that factor into all of this, and we're going to talk about all of that. But I want you to understand, this is not a retread of last week. If you've begun to pack up your stuff and say, well, I already got this information. No, no. You're going to get some insights that are altogether new that we did not touch on last week. There's a lot more, and there are some major distinctions that we're going to make. And the first one is in your notes, and it's this. Daniel 2, what we talked about last week, shows the Gentile kingdoms from man's perspective. All right? The kingdoms from the outlook of man. Daniel 7 and 8 show them from God's perspective. Okay? I want you to think about that. How does man see his own kingdoms? As gleaming metal, as precious metal, as treasure. How does God see them? As primitive, wild, slobbering beasts. Okay, and so uh, that's what we're going to see, these distinctions. It's a whole different perspective on the kingdoms of the Gentile powers of the earth. And Daniel 7 will be the final chapter in this book that is written in Aramaic. You might recall last week I had you highlight Daniel 2 verse 4, and I had you make a little note in your margin writing down Daniel 7 verse 28. Why did I do that? Because... That particular swath of Scripture from Daniel 2.4 to Daniel 7.28, that whole section is completely written not in Hebrew, the language of the Jews, but in Aramaic, the common language of the Gentile world at that time. And it's to signify that the content of this portion of Daniel dealing with the empires of the Gentiles is written and revealed in the language of the Gentiles. And I find that fascinating. So Daniel 7 will be the final chapter in Aramaic. Now when we get into chapter 8, we're still going to be dealing with some Gentile kingdoms, but that will be written in Hebrew. Why is that? I'll explain when we get there. But what we're going to do now is we're going to start in Daniel 7 verse 1. It says, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his head as he lay in his bed. So we've got the first year of the reign of King Belshazzar, who is the son of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is now dead. We read about Belshazzar last week. We looked at Daniel 5. We saw what happened. And uh, here what we see in chapter 7 is that this is, uh, the events of chapter 7 are happening before the fall of Babylon. So if he fell to the Persians in chapter 5, Belshazzar that is, This chapter, chapter 7, is sort of a flashback to the events prior to the Persians coming in and conquering Babylon. All right, you ever watch the the TV show Lost? There was a lot of flashbacks in that show. Well, this is sort of a flashback. We're flashing back to a vision that Daniel had before Darius came in, killed Belshazzar, and took over the kingdom. And so we read on. It says, Then he wrote down the dream. Daniel wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. In verse 2, Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, 
The four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. And so Daniel's going to describe four beasts. Uh, Now, I'm not going to read through that section right now. I will eventually. Uh, But you should know that after he has this vision, he then has a, a vision of God himself. And God is vividly described. And then it's followed by a vision of a man coming in the clouds who has a kingdom as well. And just like Nebuchadnezzar's dream last week gave him fits, gave him the shakes, this one messes with Daniel. It really rattles the old prophet. And after the dream, he says in verse 15, if you want to drop down to verse 15, he says, as for me, Daniel, my spirit... Within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all of this. So here you've got this prophet, and he's asking for help to understand this dream. You'll recall that Nebuchadnezzar asked him for help to understand his dream. Well, now we've got that same prophet that interpreted the king's dream needing help to interpret his own dream, and who is it that he turns to? Well, we're going to see in this text tonight that there are angels on hand. There are heavenly agents, supernatural uh, ministers to which the prophet will turn. All throughout Scripture we see these beings, and they are God's messengers to his people. In Hebrew, the word for angel is malak. In Greek, it is angelos which means messenger, and uh, they bring the revelation of God. And so we see this angel speak to Daniel. As we go on, it says, So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Verse 17, These four great beasts, that's the words of the angel, these four great beasts are four kings who arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever, and ever. All right, So we're going to break down uh, this passage beast by beast, but I want you to note that the angel said these are kings. These are not merely nations. They are not kingdoms. They are great kings, and that is one difference from chapter 2. So we got one nuance already apparent as we study this. I'm excited to break these down. Let's have a a brief word of prayer before we continue further. Heavenly Father, I pray your blessing upon our time and your word tonight. It is truly uh, the revealed word of God. We are blessed, and we are blessed as we study this, and we are reminded, Lord, that you are sovereign, and you're so sovereign that you will even use beastly, fallen kingdoms of the earth to accomplish your purpose in human history. Why the lost, the unregenerate, the corrupt are but pawns in your hand. Because nothing happens uh, that is out of your control. And so we are, we are marveling at that as we read. Would you give us further illumination and understanding tonight? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, beast number one. You ready? Let's go back to verse four. Verse four, the first was like a lion, it says. And it had eagle's wings And then as I looked, its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And in the mind of a man, the mind of a man was given to it. All right, so this is the first beast. In your notes, the kingdom represented here is Babylon. So it correlates with, you could see by your chart that it correlates with the head of gold on the statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And in fact, its representative is Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, you got a lion uh, of Babylon, and that is Nebuchadnezzar. The symbol associated with Nebuchadnezzar is a lion. Now, Babylon is likened to a lion in some other places in Scripture. I want you to take a look at Jeremiah 4, verse 7. Uh, Jeremiah happened to be the prophet in Judah uh, before Babylon invaded it. In fact, he was the one who told King Zedekiah, told the people, you better get your house in order, you better get straight with God, you need to stop worshiping idols, you need to stop rebelling, because he is going to lay waste your land via the Babylonians. They didn't listen to him. Here's what he says in Jeremiah 4, 7, a lion has gone up from its thicket, a destroyer of nations has set out, he has gone out from his place to make your land a waste. Your cities will be ruins without inhabitant. Prophets were always the bearers of good news, you see, Uh, and and that is why they often ended up dead, quite frankly. 
Uh, it's in Jeremiah 50, verse 17. Uh, he says, Israel is a hunted sheep, a hunted sheep driven away by lions. First, the king of Assyria devoured him. And now, at last, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has gnawed on his bones. And I just love the language that is used here. If you know your history, you know Israel, I, I went over this a few weeks ago, Israel split into two kingdoms. You had the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was called Israel. The southern kingdom was called Judah. The northern kingdom rebelled first. God sent in the Assyrians, and they laid waste and dispersed Israel. They came after the southern kingdom. God did not allow Assyria to conquer Judah. Uh, that was under King Hezekiah, who was a godly king. Uh, and so they, they left Judah alone. But over time, you had some bad kings. You had some rebellion. So then here comes Babylon to finish the job. And uh, what we see here is some traits associated with this lion called Babylon. In your notes, you got some characteristics. What are they? Well, it's, it's no ordinary lion. It's got eagle's wings. Eagle's wings. What does that indicate? It indicates swiftness. Wings always indicate swiftness in prophecy. Um, Nebuchadnezzar showed the ferocity of a lion, but he also showed the swiftness of an eagle, particularly at a battle called the Battle of Carchemish in 605 BC, and that, that was a unique battle. There were multiple armies involved in that battle, at least three. You had the Babylonians under this young general, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, you had uh, uh, Judah under the leadership of King Josiah, and you had uh, Egypt associated with that battle, and that was under Nico II, and the victor was Babylon by far. And uh, Ezekiel talks about Babylon in the likeness of an eagle. Uh, it says it's got long uh, pinions, great wings, plumage of many colors. But here's what we know about the eagle's wings from the book of Daniel. Daniel says that they were plucked out. And so this is another characteristic of this beast. His wings were plucked. What does that mean? That means there was an eventual humbling of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, if you know the history of Nebuchadnezzar's life between chapter 2 and chapter 7 of Daniel, something dramatic happened with the king. He went mad. He went crazy. He was disobedient, got rebellious. God took his sanity from him. And we read about the king that he, he wandered off into the wilderness, that he crawled on all fours like a beast, that he ate grass like an ox. His hair grew long. His fingernails grew long. And over time, finally, God determined that, that it was time to give him back his mind. When he did, the king was grateful, and he returned to his kingdom, and he worshiped God. And I've always marveled at that, that this man who, who laid waste to, to the, uh, the Jewish people later would turn to God. And ironically, I, I, I assume that when we get to heaven, we will see Nebuchadnezzar. Because he eventually turned to God at the end of his life. But of course, his kingdom would not last. And so, uh, before we move on, just to tie it all together, and I'm sure you've worked this out in your mind already based on the chart, but the parallel to Daniel 2 is that head of gold, all right? But we're going to move on to the next beast. This is beast number two, verse five. It says, And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, arise, devour much flesh. And so we've got this second beast here. And in your notes, the kingdom represented, you guessed it, is Medo-Persia. And so we're in alignment with the previous vision. The representative, we're going to look at a human representative now. And it's a guy named Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great. That is a key figure in the history of Persia. We're going to learn about Cyrus uh, throughout this study. We're going to get to a portion of our, uh, our study here where his name will come up again. But he was the main figure in Persian history. There would be successors. There are kings. You might have heard of Xerxes. You might have heard of Artaxerxes, both Persian. But Cyrus, by far the greatest figure in that kingdom. And he is symbolized here in your notes as a bear. And there are some specific characteristics of this bear. We see first in your notes, it was raised up on one side. What does that refer to? You may recall, as we spoke of Medo-Persia last week, 
And we noticed that there were two arms uh, on that statue in the section representing Persia. That means there's a dual alliance, okay? But it was not, it was not a balanced alliance. You had the Medes, you had the Persians, but the Persians were by far stronger, more powerful than the Medes. And so this is uh, an unbalanced uh, co-regency, if you will. In your notes, we note that there are three ribs in its mouth, in the mouth of this bear. Uh, The three ribs indicate the three nations that Medo-Persia had recently conquered, and, and those can be identified as Babylonia, as Egypt, and as Lydia. And so that, that was all originally under the Babylonian Empire, uh, but here Medo-Persia has gone forth, has conquered it all, and it is told in this vision to go forth and, in your notes, devour much flesh. So it's already got three ribs in its mouth, but it's told you're going to devour much flesh, and so there is an expectation for it to conquer more, and that is precisely what Persia would do. The Persian Empire would go forth. It would wreak a great deal of havoc on the earth beyond its, its previous conquest, and so this flesh is distinct from the three ribs in its mouth. Uh, there, there would come a king that I've mentioned named Xerxes. He would command a, a force of over one and a half million men. That's quite an army. Uh, he would command a fleet of over 300 ships against the nation of Greece uh, in, in, in the future uh, to this time. Perhaps you've seen the movie 300. I don't know if you've seen that. I don't recommend it. It's a little cartoony for my taste, kind of a non-historical movie. Xerxes appears as a character. He's sort of an effeminate giant in that movie. I don't really get that. Uh, but he was a very historical uh, conqueror and leader of Persia. And what you must know is that despite all the might, all the conquest of this empire, they were but the puppets of God. And we read in Isaiah 13, verse 17, it says, This is the Lord. Behold, I am stirring up the Medes against them who have no regard for silver and do not delight in gold. Their bows will slaughter the young men. They will have no mercy on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes will not pity children and Babylon. The glory of kingdoms, the the splendor and pomp of the Chaldeans will be like Sodom and Gomorrah. Whoa, what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? They were firebombed, right, by God when God overthrew them, okay? And so God is using this Gentile pagan empire as he did many, many times throughout human history. And so just to tie it all up here, the parallel to Daniel 2 is, of course, the silver chest and arms. But this bear, you'll also note, in keeping with that metal statue, if you recall, the metals got less valuable, right, as you descended down that statue, okay? Well, this this particular beast, the bear, even though the bear is fearsome and the bear is perhaps even stronger than a lion, I I don't know. Uh, If you were to to tell me which of the two critters uh, was the most majestic, which one would you say? I think most people would say the lion. Why? Maybe it's that big regal mane it's got. I don't know, but that is the reputation of the lion, and certainly it was the reputation in Daniel's day. And then he goes on in verse 6 of Daniel 7. He says, After this I looked, and behold, another... Beast number three, another like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads and dominion was given to it. And so this is beast number three in your notes. And the kingdom represented here is Greece. Okay? Uh, Greece, as you might suspect. But the representative, very specifically in history, is none other than Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, the first conqueror in the history of the Greek Empire. In fact, uh, many would, would say he was the greatest conqueror in the history of the world. Alexander. Uh, the symbol here is that of a leopard. And I want to show you something very interesting. Have you ever seen a painting of Alexander the Great? I've got one I want to show you. This is a picture of Alexander the Great. Now that is a current drawing. That's not very, that's a fairly recent drawing. But I want you to notice uh, that that traditionally as he is seen astride his trusty steed uh, Bucephalus. Alexander was so famous we know the name of his horse. All right. Now you'll note that there is a leopard skin draped across the front of his horse and tucked under the saddle 
upon which Alexander sits. And so there is a connection to this scripture. Now you may be thinking, well, Pastor Scott, that's a recent drawing. It was probably done by some Bible nut who wants to just read history into the words of Daniel. Okay, that's fair, fair observation. Uh, Let's go back a little further. This is the next picture of Alexander the Great. This is much, much older. In fact, this is not a painting. This is a wood carving. But notice, though it is centuries and centuries old, you still see a leopard skin on Bucephalus right there. Very, very interesting. But we can go back farther than that. Look at this next picture of Alexander. This is the earliest known image of Alexander the Great. I don't even know how old this is. And it is uh, damaged, as you can see, but peeking past the damaged portion of that rendering, you see right around the neck of Bucephalus a very small strip of leopard skin. And so it's fascinating. You've got this historic person, Alexander the Great, connected to this prophecy of Alexander where he is represented by a leopard. Isn't that something? Pretty interesting stuff. Uh, The leopard here, and we can move on from that picture, the leopard is, uh, in contrast to the lion, less grand, less majestic, but a lot of people, especially in Daniel's day, would argue that uh, he was swifter. It is a swifter predator than a lion. And so let's look at some characteristics of this particular beast. He's got in your notes four wings, four wings, and so that indicates not just swiftness, but great swiftness. Okay, you'll recall that the lion had two wings. Well, this cat's got uh, twice as many wings, and so he is twice as swift. Alexander traveled faster and conquered more land than any man in all recorded history, and so this this, uh, number of wings indicates that great speed. Uh, But I would say that the number of wings is connected to another characteristic, which I want to show you. What else does this cat have in quadruple? He's got four heads, four heads, and that is indicative of four generals. You see, in 323 B.C., Alexander died. He died quite young. He was 32 years of age. It might interest you to know that he died in Babylon. Uh, He also died after a drunken orgy, so that shows you the kind of life that he led. He had no successor, Alexander had no children, so his kingdom was divided amongst his four generals. And in your notes, there is a chart, uh, kind of a boxy little chart on the right-hand side, and it's there that you could place uh, this content that's coming up. There are four generals. The name of the first general is Ptolemy. Ptolemy. And so the kingdom of Alexander, after his death, was divided. Part of it was the southern section of Egypt, Palestine, and Arabia. That was given to Ptolemy, okay? Egypt, Palestine, and Arabia. The second general is a guy named Seleucus. Seleucus got the eastern section, which means he got Syria, Babylonia, and territories as far east as India. Alexander made it all the way to India. Bucephalus had to go up against elephants, okay? Uh, So Seleucus got the east. Cassander is the third general. He got the western section, And that would include Macedonia and, of course, Greece. And then finally, uh, there's the general Lysimachus. Lysimachus took the northern section, which would be Asia Minor. And that, uh, that included a place called Bithynia. It also, if you care, included a place called Thrace. Uh, if you read your New Testament, you know from the epistles, Paul and, and the book of Acts, of course, Paul visited a lot of Asia Minor. You see some of these names in his letters. Okay, but, but that's how Alexander's kingdom was divided up, four ways. And then finally in your notes uh, to this beast, dominion. Dominion was given, okay? And as well, the parallel to that, uh, as you've already guessed, I'm sure, uh, to Daniel 2. In, in Daniel 2, we see the belly of bronze, the belly and thighs of bronze is indicative of this kingdom as well. So Daniel goes on in verse 7. He says, after this, I saw... In the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. And it had, it had great iron teeth. Okay? What kind of teeth? Iron teeth. And it devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And so here you've got beast number four, which in your notes is, of course, the Roman Empire. It's the Roman Empire. And there's, there's really no single 
uh, historical representative that we're going to tie to this, um, you could actually just put them all in there. And so the historical representative, I, w- I would say, are just all the Roman Caesars, all right? Take your pick. You got Julius Caesar, you got Augustus, you got Tiberius, you got Domitian, you got Nero. Just pick a name, they all bad. They are all rotten to the core. And so far, this beast accurately describes the Roman Empire of history as we know it. Uh, of course, this, for Daniel, this was an empire yet to be realized, as was Greece. Uh, it was yet future to him. We can look back and we can see them in history. And we can see that this is Rome, especially when compared with the iron legs of Rome from the last vision last week. Because Rome, as we said, was this undefeatable war machine that stomped out you know, uh, its, its opposition uh, through, as, as though with an iron heel. Um, now, I will say that liberal scholars today, they look at this and they point to the next characteristic that we're about to highlight and they say there's no way that this could be a reference to Rome. What is the next characteristic? Look at verse 7, the second part of that. It says that this beast was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Ten horns. Now, you might say, stop right there. Now, there's nothing about Rome that's indicative of ten horns. Uh, There's nothing historically that that could represent, nothing we could point to with any, any accuracy. Uh, but look, look here at, at verse 8. It says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them uh, another horn, a little horn, before which uh, three of the first horns were plucked up by its roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Okay, so this beast is unlike any of the other beasts. In what way? Well, none of the other beasts have horns. We don't see horns on any of the other beasts. But the way Daniel describes something new is happening here. Now, it's got, it's got iron incorporated into it, so there's a connector to what we identified as Rome in Nebuchadnezzar's vision. And what we noticed about that particular uh, a vision is that the, the, the Roman Empire could be divided into two phases, a historic phase and a future phase, okay? And so in the same way, this beast has a historic representative in the form of the Roman Caesars, but my friends, there is a prophetic representative as well, and in your notes, that representative is the future Antichrist, Antichrist, Okay? And I'm going to share a little bit more about that individual in just a bit here. But the symbol is not a recognizable animal. We don't have a lion or a bear or a leopard here. We've got something that can only be described as a monster. This is a monster in your notes. But he's got some specific characteristics. So what do we got? We've already kind of taken note here verbally. He is terrifying. He is exceedingly strong. He's got great iron teeth. And so clearly that is an allusion to the iron nature of Rome, referring to its great crushing power and might. Uh, It it goes forth, it devours and tramples what was left, all right? Uh, That would be previously uh, conquered civilizations. Rome had no interest, uh, as Babylon did, to develop cultures. You recall that Nebuchadnezzar had his, you know, uh, Nebi's youth program where he took Daniel and the, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he tried to make good Babylonians out of them. Rome had no interest in that. They just destroyed. They were content to just take and steal and destroy and break things. Uh, They just wanted to crush and stamp. So now we get to this final characteristic that has raised such consternation among scholars, the ten horns. What in the world are these ten horns? This is new. No beasts have them. And so we've got a future fulfillment in order here. Now, before we move on, I just want to say that this is a, this is a coalition, all right? Now, we, we touched on this last week because we cross-referenced with the book of Revelation, as we will later on in this, in this study. But there's a, a parallel here, just to kind of tie it all up, is the legs of iron, the feet of iron and clay, just to kind of get that on the, on the page there. But I want you to know that horns represent something. They represent power. 
Horns represent power. Each of these ten horns represents a separate kingdom that helps make up this new, revived Roman Empire. Uh, at some point in the future, Rome will be resurrected and it will, it will be accompanied by a coalition of ten nations. Okay? And we see, according to this prophecy, that three of those nations, in the form of horns, they are uprooted and they are replaced by a little horn, a little horn, an eleventh horn, and it will take their place. And what this means in your notes is that the little horn is the Antichrist who will defeat three of these kingdoms during his rise to power, okay? Okay? And so this, this individual will be the greatest human ruler in history. The world has never known anybody uh, that was as great a conqueror, a ruler, a leader. Now, like all human rulers, he will have a rise to power. And anybody that has ever stepped on the world stage in a significant manner has had a rise, and, and many of those rises to power are quite ruthless. Uh, I think of Napoleon. I think of Stalin. I think of Hitler. And they all become conquerors and significant historic figures by, by exploiting people. And it's no different with Antichrist. He will do something to arrive at power. Now, I want you to know that the final book of your Bible is called Revelation. And it is, it is called that because it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay? The book of Daniel, you could, you could call the book of Daniel the revelation of Antichrist. Because he is the prominent figure in this book. Uh, there is no more important figure in terms of interrelation uh, with mankind and with Israel than the Antichrist in the book of Daniel. What will he be like? Well, he will be a he. He will be an individual human being. I don't think Antichrist will be an organization. Okay? I don't think he will be a nation. I think he will, he will be... Uh, represented by, by a coalition of nations, but just like the angel told Daniel that these beasts are kings, they are kings, this beast uh, has a figurehead in its prophetic iteration, and it will be a human being who will be the Antichrist, okay? And so Daniel uh, is, is going to uh, revisit this beast, so in between what we just read, he's going to talk with the angel. And then in verse, uh, in verse 12, excuse me, in verse 19, he's going to come back to this, this particular beast because he, he wants to understand what he's looking at. And he says in verse 19, Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying, teeth of iron, claws of bronze. Very interesting. Claws of bronze. And which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with his feet. And, and the ten horns which were on its head. And the other horn that came up uh, before which uh, three of them fell. And the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things. What in the world? And that seemed greater than its companions. And so Daniel notices there's something different about this beast from all the others. You've got iron incorporated. That's reminiscent of Rome. But now he mentions bronze. Did you catch that? What was bronze on the statue? That was Greece, wasn't it? And so there's something reminiscent of Greece. Do you know that the Roman Empire was obsessed with Greek culture? It's called Hellenization. Uh, they all adopted the manners and customs and religions of the Greeks. They stole all their culture. They stole their fashion. They stole their deities that's when Hercules became Heracles and Zeus became Jupiter and, and, uh, you know, and so, so on and so forth. They were just ripoffs of, of Greece. And so Daniel undoubtedly notices uh, all of this and he sees the ten horns, which don't appear on any of the other beasts, and then this little horn that uproots three of them. Look at verse 21. It says, As I looked, the horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came. And judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, as for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole world, the whole earth, and trample it down and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns, I love it when Scripture explains itself. 
As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise. See, I'm not making this up. These are ten kings. This is the confirmation that these horns are, in fact, future kings. They shall arise. That means it hadn't happened yet. Hadn't happened for Daniel. Hadn't happened for you and me. And so this monster, this revived Roman Empire, which I told you that Rome was never truly conquered last week. Nobody really conquered Rome. It's as though this monster, uh, at some point, say, in the 5th century, okay, that that they just found a cave. This monster found a cave and went in there and laid down and went to sleep and they've just been hibernating. And at some point in the future, this beast will come out of its hibernation and it will appear in the form of a ten-nation coalition around the time of the tribulation. And it says, And another shall rise after them. Another what? Another horn. Another horn. So he's talking about the ten horns, and it says, and another, this is now the future kingdom, and another horn shall arise after them. This is that little horn. Who is the little horn? Antichrist, that's right. He is spoken of in 2 Thessalonians 2 as the man of lawlessness. Does that ring a bell? Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 says, let no one, verse 3, deceive you in any way, for that day will not come. Unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness, Antichrist, is revealed. The son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. And folks, what I just read... That taking a seat in God's temple and proclaiming himself to be God, that, my friends, will be the single event that strikes fear and awareness into the heart of the Jewish people during that time, the tribulation. So we're going to unpack that more in the weeks to come. But this Antichrist, he's called the man of lawlessness. He's called the beast from the sea in Revelation 13. I think I read this last week. Verse 1 of Revelation 13, I saw a beast rising out of the sea with how many horns? Ten horns. Notice the ten horns. And seven heads with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. So you got a beast in Daniel, ten horns. You got a beast in Revelation with ten horns. Coincidence? I don't think so. And so back to Daniel 7, verse 20, uh, 24, second part of that, says that he shall be different from the former ones, this, this horn, and shall put down three Kings, represented by three horns. So this little horn, Antichrist, is said here to defeat three of these rulers, these uprooted horns, in the last days in his rise to power. Is he going to defeat them militarily? Is he going to double-cross them? Is, he, is it going to be some treacherous act, uh, maneuver on his part, could be any of the above. I don't know. I don't know. I think there, uh, that, that many ascents to power are like this, as I have described. Um, there's backstabbing. There's conniving. That's politics, okay? Um, but I suspect it'll be this way with the Antichrist ascent. Now let's look at some characteristics of the Antichrist. Try to write as small as you can, because there's a lot of content here, all right? You're like, oh my gosh, are we back in school? Sort of. Sort of. Uh... The first thing is that he's an intellectual genius and a great orator, all right? You're not going to get to where you are in this stage of, of the world and, and not be an intellectual, uh, formidably smart person. He is highly intelligent, and he's a great communicator. We've already heard that he will speak great things. He will be a master communicator. Verse 25, he shall speak words against the Most High. So in your notes, he's going to be a blasphemer. A blasphemer. It says that he shall wear out the saints of the Most High. So in your notes, he'll be a persecutor of believers. Okay? Intellectual genius, great order, blasphemer, persecutor, of believers. It goes on, it says that he shall think to change the times and the law. Now, what in the world does that mean? That's sort of an enigmatic, uh, cryptic uh, 
turn of phrase there. Can I give you what I think is the best interpretation? Um, I believe that uh, it says he'll change the times and the law. How do the Jews worship Yahweh in this phase, in Daniel's day? How do the Jews worship Yahweh? Through the law, right? Through obedience to the law, which, which incorporates sacrifice, doesn't it? Is that going to happen again during the tribulation? Yes, it will. Because the Antichrist is going to form a covenant with Israel that will allow them to do this for a period of time. Well, we're going to get to all that. But this says at some point he would seek to change the times and the law. Do you understand that according to the law, the way that the Jews worship, there are very specific times that are important. There are times for certain feasts. There are times uh, to, uh, to have ceremonies. Uh, there are times to do a lot of things. And he will, when he takes his place in the temple, as Second Thessalonians told us he would do, what is he doing? He is proclaiming himself to be the object of the worship of the Jews. And by doing that, he is mucking around with the times and the law. And so what this means in your notes is that the Antichrist will seek to alter Israel's religious observances. Okay? Uh, he's going to present himself, and I'm going to describe what that will be like later on. Uh, but he's basically going to try to succeed where Nebuchadnezzar failed and where Persia failed. You'll recall Nebuchadnezzar in the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Builds that statue, kind of an effigy of himself. When you hear the music play, everybody bow down, worship me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they say, no way, not going to bow. And he says, okay, fire up the furnace, right? But they were still faithful, and of course, God delivered them. Daniel, under Persia, same kind of thing. Darius's advisors talk him into saying, you know, nobody should be praying except to you, O king. And so they mandate that because they know Daniel prays at the same times every day, according to the law. And so he continues to do that, and they throw him in the lion's den. And so we see these kings fail because they, they, the people of God remain faithful throughout. Well, Antichrist is going to seek to be successful. He's going to fail too, all right? But it says, it goes on, it says, And they shall be given into his hand. He's speaking of, uh, he's speaking of the Jews. They, that sh- they shall be given into his hand, the Antichrist's hand. How long? For a time, times, and and half a time, a very curious phrase right there, time, times, and half a time. It's an expression that we see elsewhere in the book of Daniel. Um, There's a precedent in this very book in chapter 4 where the word times used in multiple times equals years. And so based on that, the best way to interpret this phrase, time, times, and half a time, is that time, the word time means year. All right, so you got time, that's one year. You got times, that's two more years. And half a time. How many years is that? Three and a half years, okay? When is the point in the tribulation that Antichrist is going to assume his place in the temple and proclaim himself as an object of worship? It's at the midpoint of the tribulation. How many years is the tribulation? Seven years. So what's half of that? Three and a half years. Time, times, and half a time. Okay? So that, in your notes, is the period that he will seek to subdue Israel. Three and a half years. Okay? All this is going to start to make sense. I promise. Verse 26. But the court shall sit in judgment. His dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. So all ends well here in the Cliff Notes versions of, of, of this. Antichrist will be defeated. We know that. At the coming of the Son of Man, Christ, uh, you might be thinking about Nebuchadnezzar's dream and you see this big old rock that's coming. You're like, is anything like that in this dream? Glad you asked. Because in your notes, number five, we're going to look at the Son of Man. He sees Uh, One coming like unto the Son of Man. And in your notes, that kingdom is the everlasting kingdom. This is not Babylon. It is not Greece, Persia, Rome. And this is the everlasting. All of those ended. This one won't. It won't end. And it's identified as, in your notes, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And so, whereas all the other kingdoms were literal human kings, this is 
uh, symbolized as a king of kings, because that's what he is, a king of all kings. And of course, this is connected to last week's vision, Daniel 2. It's the stone cut without human hands. You can see it in the chart, comes right across. By the way, Moving on in verse 9, God the Father is described in vivid detail. Take a look at this in verse 9. It says, As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days, that's, that's the Father, okay? The Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. Now, take note of that description. That's a very, very important description because that is the only description in the entire Bible of God the Father. You don't see him described in detail like this except right here. And incidentally, it completely corresponds with the way Jesus himself is described in Revelation chapter 1, verse 13, where it says, And in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man... Clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest, the hairs of his head were white. Some of you people with white hair ought to be feeling pretty dang good about yourselves right now. Okay? His, uh, his, the hairs of his head like white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face like the sun shining in full strength. I mean, this is as, as much as human language can allow to depict uh, the Lord. High and lifted up, but the point is he's the exact representation of God. The fullness of the Godhead in bodily form, all right? So back to Daniel, verse 10. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. And so here we've got, uh, in this verse, a continuous river of what? What's this river flowing from the throne? What is it made of? Fire. It's a, it's, a, it's a stream of fire gushing from the throne. What does fire represent? Uh, it represents judgment. It's judgment. Uh, Hebrews 12, 29, our God is a consuming fire. Isaiah 66, 15, for behold, the Lord will come in fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger in fury, his rebuke with flames of fire. Uh, You say, well, that sounds very Old Testament. Well, here comes some New Testament. You ready? 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 8, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Sounds like the Old Testament. You you could just as well be reading Daniel, but you're in 2 Thessalonians. Uh, It goes on, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. You say, will God send someone to hell who has not professed faith in Christ? Yes. Yes. Because he is a just God. He's a just God. There is a judgment that awaits for all who do not, according to this, obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see that the God of the New Testament can be seen as wrathful, can't we? Some people say, well, the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath and and judgment, but the God of the New Testament is merciful. (laughs) Same God, same exact God. God doesn't change from testament to testament, okay? Incidentally, after the great white throne judgment, which, by the way, that's the judgment you don't want to be at. That's the judgment for the unrighteous. After that judgment, you see the throne of God, and there the stream of fire is transformed into what? Revelation 22, 1 says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. And I would note here, and i got to hurt, there's so much, I'd get so excited, I hope you bear with me, but there's a thousand thousands here. A thousand thousands. What are they doing? They're serving Him. Who serves God in heaven? Angels. And so there's a thousand, thousands. How many is that? Millions. Millions of angels. And then what? And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him in judgment. Who's going to stand in judgment at that time? 
the souls of men. The souls of the unrighteous. Now listen, we've talked about major judgments. You've got the great white throne, right? That's for the general unrighteous. Is that what this is? No. Why not? Because chronologically, the great white throne happens at the end of the millennium. Okay? The thousand year reign of Christ on earth. That hasn't happened yet. Okay? There's the uh, judgment seat of Christ. Is that what this is? No, that's for the righteous. That's where you and I will be. We who are in Christ. Okay? This is not that. So what is this? I believe this is the judgment of Matthew 25 that Jesus speaks of. And we call it the judgment of the nations. We call it the judgment of the sheep and the goats. And so this is at the end of the tribulation. Anybody that has come through the tribulation, the Lord's going to divide them right and left. As a shepherd says, divides the sheep from the goats. Guess which one's the righteous and guess which one's the unrighteous. All right? And these, he will say, uh, you know, in as much as you've done it uh, unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Who are his brethren? That would be Israel. That would be the Jews. And so in as much as you've treated my brethren, the Jews, during this period of seven years of hell on earth, uh, enter into your rest. Okay? So only the faithful, only the righteous will recognize the Jewish people as being God's people. The unrighteous who have not received Messiah will not recognize and they will persecute the Jewish people during the tribulation. This is the judgment for them. They will stand in judgment. And we go back to Daniel. And in verse 11 it says, I looked then because of the sound of the great words of the horn was speaking and as I looked the beast was killed. The beast is the Antichrist. And its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives prolonged for a season at a time. Now, verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and everybody cheers, right? Because he came uh, to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. Who is it? Ah, it's Jesus Christ. And what are the characteristics? In your notes, he's coming on the cloud. He's coming on the clouds. He's coming to judge. What? Jesus? The man of peace? That's right. He's coming to judge. Both God and man he is. He is deity. He is humanity. He is called what? A son of man. Folks, that term is a term that combines deity and humanity. So this is Christ, both God and man. You say, how do you know this is Jesus? Son of man is his favorite term for himself all through the Gospels. He constantly calls himself the son of man. And here we let the context determine the meaning. Uh, he comes to the ancient of days. He is near God the Father. Verse 14, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. All right? And so in your notes, this is a kingdom that never ends never ever ends all right you say well I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure this is Christ it doesn't say it's Christ you say it's Christ I don't know if I trust you on that would it help you if Jesus himself tied himself to this prophecy because that's what he does in Mark 14 he says in verse 61 the the, the wicked high priest of Israel is uh, kind of holding a mock trial, a mockery of a trial, shall we say, uh, before he goes to Pilate. And it says there uh, that he remained silent and made no answer. And again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ? They're trying to get him to, to say he is because they would say that's blasphemy. Are you the Christ, the Messiah, uh, the Son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And he could have stopped right there and that would have been enough to meet the criteria of blasphemy in the eyes of the Pharisees. Uh, because I am is that one of those statements, ego a me, I am. Think of the burning bush, I am that I am. It always drove the Jews crazy when he would say that, but he goes on and, and gets very specific. He says, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. There's not a Jew in that room that didn't know what he was referring to. They knew he's referencing Daniel. They knew it. Claim to deity right there. All right. So we are going to look now, as we wind this down, we're going to look at chapter 8 as succinctly as I can. Chapter 8, he's got, a, he's got another vision here of a few more beasts. 
And they are in parallel with what we have read. And in verse 1, it says, In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first. And I saw in the vision when I saw I was in Susa, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I was at the Ulai Canal. I raised my eyes, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. And I had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other. All right, the wheels might start turning for you right here. He says, And the higher one came up last, and I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward, and no beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. And as I was considering, behold, a male goat from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground. He came, and the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes, and he came to the ram with the two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and ran at him in his powerful wrath, and I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him, and he struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him, and there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. All right, so here Daniel backtracks to, again, before the fall of Babylon to Persia, and he relates this vision in the third year of Belshazzar, which came after the first vision. So there's a two-year gap between these visions. Now, what's interesting is the language changes to Hebrew. We're not in Aramaic anymore. How come? Well, the middle section that we walked through last week and up until this point was all in Aramaic, and that dealt solely with Gentile nations that will come and conquer uh, one another successful, uh, successively. Uh, this is a change in thought. This section is still dealing with some of those Gentile kingdoms, but it, it, it deals with human history specifically as it relates to Israel. Okay? This gets very specific in terms of these empires' relationship to the Jews. And so that's why we're going back to Hebrew. Uh, okay, so um, where is Daniel in this vision? Physically, he's in Babylon. In the vision, he is in the king's palace in a place called Susa. And he sees these two beasts, and he wants to understand what they represent. And so in verse 15 of chapter 8, he says, When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. Behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Ulai, and he called, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. Now, you might recognize that name, Gabriel. And this is, of course, one of two angels in all of Scripture mentioned by name, not counting Lucifer. Yes. So the two holy angels, shall we say, are Gabriel and Michael. And Michael is the archangel, the only archangel. Gabriel is not an archangel, at least... He's not described as one, but we see him, and we see him here in Daniel, and you also see Gabriel in the New Testament. You remember where? He speaks to Zechariah about the impending birth of John the Baptist, and of course he speaks to Mary about the Son of God, whom she is carrying. So that's pretty cool to think of. This angel, man, angels have seen everything. They have been around since before creation. They know all the stories. So Gabriel is all over the Bible. And uh, it says in verse 17, He came near to where I stood, and when he came, I was frightened, and I fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and he made me stand up. He said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation. For it refers to the appointed time of the end. As for the ram that you saw with the two horns, these are the kings of Medes and of Persia. All right? The indignation would refer to the exile of the Jewish people, their time in exile in Babylon. Okay? It's going to be finite. So let's take these beasts one at a time. You get the ram. The ram, the symbol, is for Medo Persia in your notes. And specifically, it's for a guy named Darius III. Darius III. Now, he's got some characteristics. We note he's got one horn bigger than the other. And so if you recall about the Medes and the Persians, what are they? They're a co-regency. You remember the bears hunched up on one side 
Well, this is the same kind of thing. This ram's got one horn that's bigger than the other. So Persia and the Medes, right? The two things there. Uh, We note that he appears victorious at first, but he is soon destroyed. He's soon destroyed. That's the ram. It's in full alignment with uh, the other kingdoms on your chart in that column. Okay, now, who's the goat? I've got a picture of the goat right here. I want you to see the goat. There's the goat. Oh, wait. (laughs) <laughs> All right, I thought that would go well in North Carolina. Anyway, uh, let's look at Daniel 8, verse 21. It says, in the goat, this is the true goat. It's not Michael. It's not MJ. It's the king of Greece. Well, that's specific. And the great horn between his eyes is its first king. The first king, okay? So that's, that's, that's a separate, that's a very specific person in the empire of Greece. The first king. Who was the first king? Think about that. Uh, As for the horn that was broken in place of which four others arose. Okay? So you got a great horn who is the first king of Greece. That horn is broken and then four more horns arise. Are you starting to put this together? Need a little help here? He goes on. He says four kingdoms shall arise from his nation. Whose nation? That great horn that is broken but these kingdoms will not have his power. Okay, so let's break it down. The goat symbolizes Greece. Okay. Who is the prominent horn? You've probably already figured this out. It's Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, the first king of Greece. And so we see this goat attack this ram with great fury, breaks its horns, and then proceeds to trample the ram. Well, that's fulfilled in history. Greece, under the leadership of uh, Alexander, would come against the Medes and the Persians. He defeated Persia at the Granicus River in Asia Minor. That's one major battle, 334 B.C. Um, This took a few battles to completely conquer Persia. Uh, A year and a half later, he defeats Persia again at Issus, uh, which is uh, on the tip of the Mediterranean. That's 333 uh, BC. And then finally, there's a, a, a very important battle in history called Gogamela. Gogamela, and that's when he utterly broke the power of the Persians who were under the leadership of Darius III. Darius III. And so that's, that's how Alexander rose to power. Incidentally, I should tell you that I find this fascinating. Before, before Alexander took out Persia, he first invaded Jerusalem. And history tells us that in 333 B.C., he comes into Jerusalem. The high priest of Jerusalem at the time is a guy named Jedua. Jedua. Jedua goes out from the temple to meet Alexander, greets him, and then he invites him uh, to come in and to read from the scrolls. And he shows him the book of Daniel. And he shows him the prophecy concerning uh, the Greek empire. And so what happened is that Alexander was so impressed with the eloquence of this high priest that he did not destroy Jerusalem as he had intended. But he went into the temple and he worshipped. He worshipped. Now, I'm not implying that he became a convert to the one true God, but he was impressed with this prophecy. And uh, I, I don't know if it's at this point he started draping a leopard skin over his horse, but he did go forth and he fulfilled prophecy uh, after he showed up in Jerusalem. So we're going to backtrack now in verse 8. Go back to verse 8. Then the goat became exceedingly great, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken. We, we already know that Alexander died at a young age. And instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. And so in your notes, these four horns represent, you guessed it, uh, four generals. And we've named them all. They're on that chart that you filled in. Okay, Ptolemy, Seleucus, Cassander, Lysimachus. Verse 9, one of them, out of one of them, one of these horns, one of these generals came A little horn. Well, there's a phrase that we've seen. A little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, toward the glorious land. It grew great 
even to the host of heaven. And some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. And it became great even as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him. And the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. So you got a little horn that emerges. Now we had a little horn in the previous dream. Who was that? Antichrist. Who is this little horn? Well, I want to introduce you to a concept in biblical prophecy. And it's in your notes. It's called the dual fulfillment of prophecy. Okay? And here's the definition of dual fulfillment. You've got in your notes two events separated by time which serve as a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. You with me? So not all prophecies work like that. Uh, but some do. I'll give you an example. Isaiah, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Near fulfillment to that is the birth of who? Jesus Christ. We all know that from Christmas time. Unto us a son is born, right? A child is born, a son is given. That's Christ. Well, what's the far fulfillment? If you read on in Isaiah, it says, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Well, which part of the gospel did that happen in? I don't remember that. Hadn't happened yet. When does that happen? Happens in the kingdom age, in the millennial kingdom. That's when the government will truly be on his shoulders. So that is the far fulfillment. You see, Abrahamic covenant. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a mighty nation. That's the near fulfillment. And through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Well, that wouldn't be fulfilled until Christ came along. That's the far fulfillment. And so what's the purpose by bringing two widely separated events into the scope of prophecy, you've got uh, both the purposes of, of the near and the far fulfilled. So in your notes, the purpose is to provide a message for both the prophet's own day as well as for a future time. All right? And so I would say, in addition to that, that we have another benefit here is that we see that God gives both near, in your notes, near and far view, so that the fulfillment of one is the assurance of the fulfillment of the other. Okay? So you got a near and a far fulfillment. If the near fulfillment was already achieved, that gives you a lot of hope and confidence that the far fulfillment is going to come to pass. Right? All right. So the near fulfillment of this prophecy is that this little horn in Daniel 8 is a guy named, and, and you're going to have to take a little time to spell this, all right? It's Antiochus IV, Epiphanes, all right? That's a lot. I know that's a mouthful. And, or Anti, you could just call him Antiochus Epiphanes. For some reason, he's the fourth, right? There, were, there was a first through three before him. He's the fourth. Epiphanes is kind of a nickname. Uh, he is a descendant of Seleucus, who obtained uh, the, the south part of Alexander's kingdom. And so this is a descendant of Seleucus. I'm going to show you a picture of Antiochus. There he is. Handsome fella, isn't he? Daniel 11 calls him the contemptible person. He is one of the greatest persecutors Israel has ever known. How bad was he? He was an anti-Semite to the core. The Jews mocked his name, Epiphanes. They called him Epimene. Epimene, which means madman. Why did they call him a madman? Well, one reason is he murdered 40,000 Jews in three days. I don't know anybody that's done that. I'm not even sure Hitler did that. Three days? I don't know. I don't know. That's sadistic. He enslaved countless others. He forbade the reading of the Holy Scriptures and the tradition of circumcision. He would take um, uh, 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 infants and throw them headlong off of buildings, along with even mothers that were still nursing. He'd throw them both off. And uh, there is an, there's an incident in the book of um, one of the Maccabean books, Second Maccabees. It describes a mother who has seven sons, a Jewish mother, and he cut out the tongues of her sons and roasted them alive on a flat iron right in front of her, and then he, then he slit her throat. So this is an awful human being. This is scum of the earth right here. So, but he is the near fulfillment. Now, what is the far fulfillment? Well, we've already talked about him. That's the Antichrist. So essentially, this guy is a shadow. Antiochus was a historical individual that was a shadow of the future Antichrist. 
Antichrist will do all that Antiochus did and more. All right? Here is a, a comparison between the two in your notes. Both would conquer much. Okay, Daniel 8, he grew in power to the south, to the east, toward the beautiful land. Uh, that would be Egypt, Syria, Israel. Uh, Antichrist in Revelation 13, who is like the beast, who can wage war against it? So they're going to conquer a lot, each one of them. Number two in your notes, both would magnify themselves. They're going to magnify themselves. Antiochus did. Uh, it, said, it set itself up to be as great as the commander of the army of the Lord, took away the daily sacrifice from the Lord, sanctuary was thrown down. So he, he's at it. Uh, Antichrist is going to do similar things. Revelation 13. Second beast was given power to breathe, give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. All right? They, they crave worship. Satan's always craved worship. All right? Uh, number three, both would prosper through deceit. Through deceit. In Daniel 8, it says of Antiochus, he will cause deceit to prosper. He will consider himself superior. He's a liar. Uh, of the Antichrist, it says in 2 Thessalonians 2, the coming of the lawless nun, uh, one by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Number four, both would persecute the faithful. They're going to persecute uh, the righteous. We know that Antiochus did this. In chapter 8 of Daniel, without warning, he shall destroy many, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes. Antichrist will do the same. Revelation 13, 7. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. Number five, both would desecrate the temple. Now, this is, this is amazing. So this is prophesied in Daniel uh, uh, chapter 8, verse 11. This little horn is going to become great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offerings was taken away from... We've read that verse. Verse 12. As a ho and a host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offering because of the transgression. And it will throw truth to the ground and it will act and prosper. Let me tell you what Antiochus Epiphanes did when he had uh, occupied Jerusalem. He went into the temple... He desecrated it by constructing in it an idol altar, making it unclean. He then proceeded to sacrifice in the temple of God a giant sow, okay, which is abhorrent to the Jews. And he forced the priests to swallow the flesh of this giant sow that he had sacrificed on the altar. He made a broth of the remaining flesh of the sow and sprinkled it all over the temple. And he then carried off the temple candlesticks, the table of showbread, the altar of incense, various vessels. Uh, he destroyed the sacred books of the law. He then placed a large image of Jupiter in the Holy of Holies. And all this was termed by the Jews the following title. They called it the abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation. Now, ultimately, in the Maccabean era, uh, you had a family of Jews called the Maccabees. They came in and they led a force against Antiochus. They drove him out. And then they proceeded to cleanse the temple. And uh, it's spoken of in the New Testament. You actually see this event reminisced about in the New Testament. It's called the Feast of Dedication. It's called the Feast of Light. And it was during this, this uh, uh, cleansing that they, they lit lamps and they cleansed this temple for eight days. And we know this period now as Hanukkah. All right? This is where Hanukkah came from, is the, the taking out. So Hanukkah is not Jewish Christmas, all right? Hanukkah is the acknowledgement that the Jews kicked a rabid anti-Semite pagan named Antiochus Epiphanes out of Jerusalem, and they cleansed God's temple. That's what Hanukkah is, all right? So Matthew 24, Jesus talks about this. He says, so that when you see, now remember, near fulfillment, far fulfillment, okay? So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, Standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. He's talking of this event in a future sense. 
How do you know he's not talking about Antiochus Epiphanes, Pastor Scott? Uh, because Antiochus Epiphanes already did this by Jesus' day. That was passed to Jesus. He's speaking of the same type of event in a future sense. It's going to happen again. Okay. Number six in your notes. Both would be empowered by Satan. Daniel 8, his power shall be great, uh, not by his own power. Okay, Revelation 13, people worship the dragon. That's Satan because he had given authority to the beast. Okay, and they worship the beast. Who's like the beast? Number seven in your notes, both would blaspheme the Lord. Uh, Daniel 8, he shall rise up against the prince of princes. Revelation 13 says of, anti- of uh, Antichrist, it's, it opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God. Okay, and then number eight in your notes, both would eventually, and this is my favorite part, be destroyed by God. Be destroyed by God. Uh, Daniel 8 says, he shall be broken, but by no human hand. That means it's God's doing, as is many of the putting down of evil people throughout Scripture. God will do it. And we read of the Antichrist's demise in Revelation 20. Now, there's something called the scroll of Antiochus that kind of gives a glowing report about Antiochus leaving Jerusalem and fleeing. Uh, But the Jews have their own record of it how he came to an end in 2 Maccabees. It says this, the all-seeing Lord, the God of Israel. See, they give credit to God. I love it. And and Maccabees is not an inspired book by any stretch, but I believe that these were godly people. It says that the Lord, the God of Israel, struck him, Antiochus, with an incurable and invisible blow. He was seized with a pain in his bowels. Wow. For which there was no relief, and with sharp internal tortures and that very justly for he had tortured the bowels of others with many and strange afflictions yet he did not in any way stop this insolence but was even more filled with arrogance breathing fire in his rage against the Jews and they go on to say that it came about that he fell out of his chariot as it was rushing along and the fall was so hard as to torture every limb of his body I'm sorry for laughing. It goes on, it says, Thus he who only a little while before had thought in his superhuman arrogance that he could command the waves of the sea and had imagined that he could weigh the high mountains in balance was brought down to earth and carried in a litter, making the power of God manifest to all. And so, they write, the ungodly man's body swarmed with worms. What? And while he was still living in anguish and pain... His flesh rotted away, and because of the stench, the whole army felt revulsion at his decay. You have to love how the Hebrews describe things, don't you? Man, do they know how to describe uh, a death. That's crazy. Uh, I realize that the book of Maccabees is not inspired literature, but many scholars will, will tell you that they are quite reliable in terms of their accuracy and historical detail. Now let's look and see how that, how that demise compares with the future demise of the man we call the Antichrist. In Revelation 19, verse 19, it says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who in his presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. So you've got a demise in the future that is no less dramatic than the one that took place with Antiochus. This guy who was but a shadow of the one who is to come, the man of lawlessness, the man of sin, both of them God would put down. And we wrap this up by coming back to the book of Daniel in verse 26 of chapter 8, the prophet says, The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true, but seal up the vision, for it refers to many days from now. And he says, And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. Then I arose and I went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. Do you ever feel that way? When you read scripture and you are confused. Some of you are like, I I, I felt like that about 19 times tonight, Pastor Scott. Well, Daniel can identify because the word of God can be confusing. But just understand, you're in good company. This is Daniel. This is God's prophet. Okay? 
But even though he's appalled, he doesn't understand everything that he's heard God say. I still believe with all my heart that this is the word of God, that he has delivered it once and for all to the saints, and his desire is for us to read it, to seek to understand it, to the best of our ability, to ask for his Spirit's help, to illuminate it to us, and to rely on one another as we study together. And that's what I would love to continue to do with you next week as we continue this study, Understanding Bible Prophecy. We'll see you next time. Hey, I'm Pastor Scott Graham, and we want to thank you for joining us as we reach, raise, and release genuine followers of Jesus Christ here at the Lamb's Chapel. Uh, if you want to know when a video drops or when we go live, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And send this video to someone who needs to hear it. And make sure you invite them to join you here with us live this week. We'll see you soon.